All right, so today we want to jump into projects. As you guys know, we cover a lot of different projects, one in the DeFi space and also in the Neo Bank area, we've covered quite a bit. So we wanted to dive in a little deeper. Uh, we had a, uh, a chance for a project to reach out to us, say, hey, let's do a little bit of a partnership here and uh, get some insights to what's happening over there. So today we're going to cover MELD and kind of dive in a little deeper. I think you guys are going to love it. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back into TechPath. Joining me today is Mr. Ken Alling, who is the founder over at Meld. Great to have you, Ken. Thanks. Great to be here, Paul. Yeah. So let's get into a little bit about Meld in general. And I think for some of our audience, they've we've covered this slightly before on our show. And then uh, we had a chance to meet up with you guys, uh, kind of look at a potential opportunity here, and really wanted to learn a little bit about what you guys are doing. I was going through some of the white paper. And I want to show this because this kind of shows your format or your, your theme of your business model. Looks kind of complicated. Maybe you can kind of break this down for us a little bit. Sure. So this is kind of the, the genesis or the starting point for which MELD uh, initially came about, which was this idea of creating a lending and borrowing protocol similar to Aave, but that does something that no other lending borrowing protocol does in the DeFi space, which is allow you to lock up your crypto in a DeFi environment, in a non-custodial environment, in a trustless way, and then borrow fiat against it. So it is a bit of a, of a fancy diagram, but it just basically talks about this idea that you can, you see, keep control of your keys, of your assets, but you can borrow fiat against them. So within this uh, architecture, you know, there's been a lot of regulatory challenges, obviously here in the United States, not necessarily globally, because we're seeing a lot more you know, acceptance of where this market is going in places like Hong Kong, what we're seeing in the EU, South America, Middle East, et cetera. So the likelihood is we're going to see some regulatory framework here in the U.S. very soon. How are you guys regulated? Explain to me how that works on a global front. Yeah, so there's two parts to this um, on the regula regulatory side. So first is when we started, our thesis was that CFI or centralized finance, having other people control your keys is a bad idea. Um, it's not the way that uh, crypto kind of came about. It doesn't follow the ethos of crypto. Um, and we wanted to solve the problem from a crypto perspective, not from a traditional finance perspective. And so we're regulated, yes, but we're only regulated in the context of when you start to touch fiat. So fiat is a regulated um, asset, obviously. So we're registered in Lithuania. So we're in the process of getting our Lithuanian electronic money license. Um, and that will allow us to handle fiat, but it doesn't afford us anything when it comes to crypto. Crypto is kept in a separate company. Um, it's also kept in our foundation and connected to our DAO on the DeFi side. So forever shall these two elements be separated. And at the same time, we're creating this bridge that connects them together so that you're able to handle the sort of traditional DeFi, you keep your own keys and still have a bank account. Yeah. All right. So I have a lot of questions on that because it, it, I think a lot of people are starting to understand what a neo bank is, what we're going to see in terms of a new evolution of finance uh, tool sets that are going to be out there, Meld possibly being one of the leaders. I want to get into the blockchain uh, side of this. Obviously, you guys are getting ready to launch here very soon. Uh, I'm looking at the Avalanche, uh, you know, kind of their network overall. Meld, of course, is identified here. We've also taken a look at what's happening on the subnet with Avalanche. Are you an Avalanche project or, or is this a Cardano project? Which, which chain do you fall on? It's neither. Um, so the way that it works is we get the best of both worlds. We're able to work within the Avalanche ecosystem. We're using the same technology stack that Avalanche operates on with their EVM. But we are our own chain. We are a layer one blockchain similar to okay. Ethereum or Avalanche or Cardano. Um, our goal is to create this layer one blockchain that allows us to connect other blockchains to it. We're able to have kind of think of it as a, a, a chain that connects two elements together. One is a traditional fiat bank and the other is a DeFi protocol. And the chain okay. is quite literally the chain that ties these two together. Got it. OK. All right. Well, that, that clears things up quite a bit now. Um, all right. So within that, when you look at just in general of the aspect of fiat, when you're talking about where fiat is stored, the DAO, of course, controlling the, the DeFi aspect of this. 
if I were to, you know, I'm a, I'm a global citizen, I'm out there, I, I deposit into MELD and I do it in, a, in the manner of fiat, where would that fiat be stored today? So that is actually kind of interesting because when I, when I started thinking about this, I was talking about this earlier this week, um, on the fiat side, well, on the crypto side, it's non-custodial, right? Because you have a non-custodial wallet. On the fiat side, it's also non-custodial because with the license that we have, it's kind of a banking light license. We're not allowed to do anything with customers' funds. The customers' mm -hmm. funds are custody, they're held with the Central Bank of Lithuania. So we don't actually do anything. We facilitate the holding of them, we facilitate transactions, but on both sides, it's non-custodial. On one side, you keep your own keys for the crypto. On the other side, it's held by the Central Bank. Interesting, okay. Within that, uh, within that side of things, because I'm looking at your website here on meld.5 for many of you guys, if you're wanting to learn more about this project, Meld Finance, novel wallet registration, you show an SMS verification, you can do it through password, social, even email integration. And then there is this idea of private keys going into four parts. Explain how that works, because obviously we, we've seen this um, revelation of what happened with Ledger here over the last yeah. six months. Kind of explain how you're different, what makes this a unique proposition. So this is something that's gonna be rolled out probably early next year. And the idea is to do something similar to what Ledger did, but try and solve it in a way that Ledger didn't. What Ledger did is they decided to take the keys and break them up and give them to three centralized entities. What we see is that the ability to recover your keys is critical for mass adoption, but it has to be, again, it has to be done in the ethos of the crypto world. So the entities that are handling the keys when they're broken into pieces, it still needs to be decentralized. It still needs to be able to be safe and to be under your control and not within a particular umbrella of jurisdictions. So would you have, as an individual, would you actually have your own keys or would these be, how, explain how that would. You always have your own keys. Okay, yeah. all right, so, so it's just the. the... Idea is there, yeah, so it's very, it's it's quite simple, but it gets, con, you know, gets convoluted when you start talking about it from a technical perspective. Think of your, your private key, it's broken into small pieces. Each of the private pieces goes to a different, you know, this node over here or this DAO or something like that. And then it's encrypted individually in each of these three different places. Okay. So even if the DAO has access to it, the key itself, they can't decrypt it and they only have a piece of it anyway. And so when you when you elect to bring these pieces back together, you can decrypt them into a, a full picture, but no party that is holding them can decrypt it. All right, so that makes a lot of, a lot of sense. So, and you're right, different different approach to what uh, Ledger did, which was one of the, you know, the challenges I think that they faced within self custody which is an ongoing thing when you look at the regulatory side of this self custody has been one of the targets that i think people have looked at will there ever be regulatory framework around these whether it's what we see coming out of mika or within the eu uh, or even in hong kong with what we'll see coming from you know really kind of the pacific rim the concept is will we ever see regulation in that area that would affect DeFi? what's your opinion on that I think that there's going to be an attempt to do this. Um, I think that it's going to be a fight that we're going to have to fight. And I think that the starting point needs to be from the perspective of the failed uh, market actors that we've yeah. seen that have kind of caused this, right? You have Celsius, mm -hmm. you have BlockFi, you have FTX. All of these entities, they were regulated. They were following the rules. They were working within the current framework. The organizations that weren't, Ave, Compound, Us, um, any uh, DEXs, all of these, they, they live within the ethos of crypto, which means that everything is transparent. And when it's transparent, then you have a much, much less chance of the kind of behavior you saw with right. these kind of black box CFI entities. You know, Ken, do you think that we, you know, I look at this, you know, we are a big proponent of sovereignty and you know, kind of managing your own business, be your own bank in essence. And I know that's kind of, uh, you know, you've got the bankless term out there, the be your own bank from what happened with Celsius. I think the vision is right. And we definitely have seen a lot of really good uh, projects that have shown the way. 
The key, I think, will be adoption. And when you look at adoption, obviously fiat onboarding, you guys have addressed that. Do you think that that along with being able to kind of become your own bank, how far in the future do you feel like that really becomes mainstream? Because right now I feel like it's a very narrow part of the population. Yeah, most definitely. And I think that the the type of product that we have is going to be attractive to people that have felt this pain, that have felt the friction of moving between crypto and fiat. So I think that there's going to be, uh, the adoption is going to be relatively slow over the next, I don't know, six to nine months. But I think with the advent of de-dollarization, with this new introdu- introduction of a BRICS currency, and the sort of general uncertainty that you see in the dollar and in the world economy, especially with sort of private individuals, there's going to be a growing interest in taking control and owning that. But whether we like it or not, you still have to interface with the real world. You still have to touch fiat and you should be touching it in a legal and regulated way. So we see that the attraction will grow over the next nine to 12 months as this narrative plays out. Yeah, for sure. All right. So I want to hit on a few things that you guys have going. Uh, Obviously, your debit card project uh, coming into play here. Any plans for a credit card to actually be coming on online with Meld? No, it's actually that's actually the the opposite of what we're trying to do. We think that credit is a bad idea in general. Um, We are going into um, Lombard lending where you take your asset and you can borrow some of the liquidity. We don't think that especially when the broader world, you don't want to put poor people are not going to get out of poverty by going into debt. You want to give them tools to be able to build their wealth, not to go into debt. All right. So within that, these are kind of the the lending solutions, Mel versus others. This kind of shows you an example of the competitive landscape out there. Crypto assets uh, being accepted, ownership of your assets, uh, approval time instant, you know, so you're going to be able to do against. I see this as a huge opportunity for the future, especially of owning a personal, you know, an asset such as Bitcoin or others out there in the market and then being able to actually truly get lending against those because they're do you feel like there we will see this on the traditional banking side when they start to accept crypto in general you look at fidelity they've launched obviously a, a platform that has full access to bitcoin and ethereum could we see that start to propagate through the traditional banking system i think you're absolutely going to see it but you're going to see a version of it that is kind of modified to benefit those large organizations. So Mm -hmm. in the case of Mel, when you supply your asset, you, the person supplying the collateral, get a yield from it. When you borrow, you're then paying an interest. If you choose to, you can actually liquidate loans that fall outside of that balance. So the audience, the customer, is all three actors in the space. And it's our job to create a harmony or a balance between them so that all of them feel like they're being treated fairly. What you're going to see in the traditional finance world is they'll take your, they won't give you anything for it, and then they'll charge you an interest for it, and then they will take the liquidation fees. So they'll earn off of two sides and you'll lose, just like currently um, yeah, sort of small business model. and mortgages work. Yeah, the existing model today, which I think is the one that obviously everybody understands is broken. That's why crypto has been so interesting to a lot of people who start to figure out, especially those who go down the rabbit hole to really understand this. Uh, Let's get into kind of just some of the benefits you guys have in general. I was looking at at your PDF that really kind of broke it down a lot of different areas. One of the interesting areas, obviously, the unlocking value, high yield for fiat liquidity, no tax event. How is that applied into a uh, a meld architecture? Explain that a little bit more. So the way that it works is it's effectively talking about uh, capital gains tax, right? So when you sell crypto and you get profit from that, that is a a taxable event. That's capital gains. Well, if you borrow against that asset, there is no taxable event. So you're pushing, you're not, you're not avoiding taxes. You're just pushing that taxable event much farther down the road and you're able to get liquidity. Yeah. I think this is something that the the industry has been doing for quite some, it's, you know, it's one of the biggest tricks of the rich, you know, is just take loans against your assets or that's real estate. Now we're getting into opportunities with crypto, which will be real, especially in this next run, because obviously with a lot of the activity, 
you know, potentially moving into ETFs, that's going to mainstream this, you know, from the access of a lot more people getting involved in this as a true asset class, which could eventually compete with gold or even somewhat greater. So I would agree with you guys. Within that framework, Meld is one of the companies that's going to be able to enable that. How far around the, the globe, if you look at Europe, the United States, Asia, South America, is there any one particular area of, of the you know of the planet that you guys are focused on right now in terms of you know not only your participants but audience and growth? So we're focused on Europe because that's where our our license originates. But you can see that countries that have suffered under bad monetary policy are the countries that have adopted crypto the most. So we're not interested in trying to convince convert people that are not into the space, we're trying to give it to people that already have crypto. So I think that you'll see it in places like Brazil, Malaysia, Indonesia, um, China, Japan, to some degree, Vietnam, um, these areas, so Nigeria, uh, Argentina, the areas where they see immediate value by holding crypto as opposed to their native currency, which yeah. they just see the deflation of it happening. And so I think that that's the, the main area. And unfortunately, I think you're probably going to see the same thing in the States as we see a decrease in the value of the dollar over the next couple of years. How long before you see meld in the United States to where this would be a, a, a project that could be really implemented? That's really SEC and Treasury. So uh, we want to go into the United States. We really, really do. But it's going to require uh, um, it's going to require a, a, a regime that is not as hostile to the asset and that doesn't yeah. create as much uh, uncertainty in the space. We're not a big firm. We're not sort of you know massive multinational. So we can't actually sort of engage Treasury or SEC the way a, a large commercial bank can. So we need to grow outside, and then eventually we'll move stateside ASAP. All right, so very cool. I was looking at your app. Uh, first of all, you guys have done a great job on just the app design, so kudos to you guys. Um, for an actual mobile app, when would this launch to where you'd be able to utilize this? So the early beta access comes out in August, and then hopefully in September, we'll go into broader access. So you can currently go on to the, to the MeldFi uh, website, yep. go under meldby.signup, and you can sign up for early access. Those people will be the ones that will get the early access. You probably open to, to sort of global access sometime in November or December. Yeah. Now, staking, is that going to be something that will launch with the, uh, with the product, or how will that apply uh, for those who can? Staking is already available on the web app. So we have a web version as well, which is purely a non-custodial uh, wallet. So you can stake there. And over the next couple of months, we'll, add, we'll be adding many different types of staking, not just kind of Ethereum staking or Cardano staking, but more sophisticated structured products and things like that, where you can earn a higher yield if you're interested in going into more risky products. I see. Okay. All right. What would be some examples of that right now? Because, I mean, we've seen some of that out there in the marketplace that have been very successful. Uh, and if you look at just, you know, some of the staking um, applications that we've covered here on, on this show quite a bit, there's been some pretty significant yields out there. Where would you guys see growth there in that area? Probably in the, in the options or in the futures, potentially in, in perpetuals. Um, really, it's, you know, we're, we're trying to focus very much on being risk averse. So right. we're looking at lots of different providers to try and create as, as small a risk footprint as possible while having a yield that is more meaningful. And then over time, we'll expand that to more risky and more risky assets. All right. So a lot happening here. You guys are doing uh, the meld airdrop. Uh, so obviously the launch of the neobank being part of that, uh, pretty, uh, pretty significant. How will this affect, I think when I look at this in comparison to other industry players out there, you could look at MoonPay and many others that kind of fall into these, you know, this circle of, of potential uh, projects. Yeah. yeah, exactly. How will this affect you guys in, in terms of competition? what you're going to be able to offer from a neobank aspect, things of that nature. Where do you see that going? I think it's the other way around. So what you've seen is 
the lack of these types of, you know, crypto and fiat sort of on-ramping and off-ramping in a more kind of thoughtful and structured way and cheaper. Um, MoonPay and the like have been able to charge huge um, interest or, or transaction fees for, for their on-ramping and off-ramping. And so we're coming into the market at a very low rate, a half a percent for on-ramping and off-ramping. And so we're trying to actually normalize and bring this already far dated market down to a reasonable rate to attract a much, much broader audience. And then as we start to get vol volume, then we'll continue to bring that, uh, that um, exchange rate down to as low as is humanly possible. It's getting a cheap rate like that is only going to make for a more healthy overall crypto ecosystem. Yeah, I think this is a, and that's one of the, I think, big problems right now, because we have a few companies that I feel when I look at it, it seem like they're preying on on this sector, and there needs to be an opportunity, I think, to kind of take it to the next level. Looking at your roadmap, I want to talk a little bit about where you guys are going. What are some of the big, you know, potentials for what Meld is doing, especially on a broader scope? Whether it's NFTs, we get into the integration of what you guys are doing on Layer One. Talk to me a little bit about what your roadmap looks like over the next, say, twelve to eighteen months. Yeah, so uh, throughout the end of the next end of this year, we'll be launching the Neo Bank and we'll be launching the lending and borrowing protocol. So that will come together. Then come Q1, we're going to be focusing very much on uh, tokenized assets and right. effectively expanding on what you talked about. This idea of, you know, um, staking and generating a yield. We want to be able to focus on giving people the opportunity to generate a yield on the assets that they keep in their wallet. And that's really kind of where our focus is, is to just provide these, these primitives for people to manage their money in a safe way based on their control and generate an income in the same way that you have, you know, high net worth individuals and large corporations doing it. They already have these tools. We don't. And so we want right. to provide them in this DeFi ecosystem. This really starts to kind of flip the script for sure for a lot of individuals who have been dealing with crypto in general because there hasn't been, you know, solutions out there where you can do these kinds of activities. Obviously, we've already seen massive growth in the staking sector. If you, We just saw this last week when we did a big video on this, the growth of Lido and what they've been able to do uh, within that and the potential of this starting to really become somewhat um, ultra, I think, ultra competitive and available. NFTs will play a part of this, obviously, in the, you know, kind of this next bull run. What are some of the trends that you guys are watching right now from not only from the DeFi side, but also from this new creation of bank services? Because this is something we've seen Revolut. We've seen, you know, projects even here in the U.S. that have been able to bring some new solutions to consumers. Where do you see that going in the next few years? I think that it's going to have a lot to do with people being able to move their assets around very fast and very efficiently, giving them the control over it. And for them to be able to generate a yield, opposed to trying to sell them on credit cards or sell them on short term right. loans, you know, give them the tools to build wealth in the same way that wealthy people can. I think that, you know, we don't come from the traditional finance come from a new way of thinking. So we don't have, have these biases. We want to make a much flatter market where a maid in Brazil gets the exact same treatment as a stockbroker on Wall Street. I think that's the sort of killer app. And that's where this idea of a, a new type of a bank is going to sort of try and take on the sort of traditional way of dividing and conquering and looking at customers as effectively the product or just a way to get more fees out of them. We want to generate something that is that is kind of born out of the thinking of crypto as opposed to born out of the thinking of traditional finance. Right. Yeah. Well, I think this is one of the areas that we see so much interest in and these these kind of videos that we do when we get into the banking alternatives that will be out there within the marketplace. I think people uh, of all walks are starting to look at this, whether it's people that are, you know, they're highly affluent and they're just looking for other ways to do banking because of the old legacy systems that seem to slow everything down. They get their first taste of crypto and they're like, oh my gosh, this is speed of light compared to what I'm dealing with typically. So there's a lot of great opportunities here for sure. 
Ken, it's been great having you on the show today. Thank you so much. We'll make sure and leave some links down below uh, so you guys can find more all about MELD. But thanks for stopping in today. We appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for everything, Paul. I appreciate it. Excellent. All right, so you guys, make sure and drop in to the links down below when we do these kinds of partner episodes like this where we want to showcase some of these projects globally. Remember, our audience is, and matter of fact, we just clipped 160 countries here on this show, and it's all because you guys are part of the Diamond Circle. It's one of the best places you can get into for additional content. We do our Web3 podcast, all that over there, and it's free. It's very easy. We'll leave a link also down for that in the show. And it's very simple for you guys to join. If you guys want to catch me, it is out there on Twitter, at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechPath.